Welcome, everyone. I'm Jonathan Spurgle. I'm here with my colleague, Luke Bitterman, and we're here to present some new evidence and work on EOE. First, I'd like to thank Peerview for providing this session and Snowfi and Regeneron Pharmaceuticals providing this educational grant for the symposium. Look out for additional polling during this presentation. Please submit your questions and we'll ask them, answer them during the Q&A. Um, you can download the slides and the practice aids after the event and now at the, the, the URL as seen listed above. Our goals are today are really twofold. First is to discuss the recent treatment guidelines and clinical research data relating to the management of eosinophilic esophagitis or EOE. And the second is to apply the latest clinical evidence on targeted therapies into the therapeutic regimens of patients with EOE. So really we're gonna start with hot off the presses, the latest evidence on targeted biological therapies. So the question first is, why do we use the biologics for EOE? And there's several different reasons why we can. First, we can use for patients who are really sort of failing everything, sort of corticosteroid refractory patients or patients who can't tolerate corticosteroids. The other big reason why you can use biologics for EOE is that you're really now targeting that individual pathway, so really being very specific as EOE is an allergic disease. And related to that, since it's an allergic disease and you're targeting an allergic pathway, you might be able to target multiple forms of ATP. So using a systematic treatment, you can target not only their EOE, but other atopic diseases, such as asthma, or atopic dermatitis. And then there's some benefit of weekly versus daily therapy. I mean, it's most of the biologics are injections versus daily therapies or oils, so the plus or minus of each, but this is another potential benefit that some patients and families like. So the first biologic we'll talk about is dupilumab. It's been improved in the US, United States, UK, Europe, and Japan for the treatment of atopic dermatitis ages six months and above, moderate severe asthma, chronic rhinocytis with nasal polyps, paragor nodularis, as well as eosinophilic esophagitis. So it's been promoted for a lot of different type of what we call type two diseases. And the little picture gram looks at the signaling pathway for IL-4 and IL-13 as these, as these molecules exist, they bind to a receptor and lead to the signaling and activation of JAKs and STATs leading to activation and release of various cytokines. So we'll first talk about some various highlights for the American College of Gastroenterology meeting. So the first thing we'll do, we'll present the abstract presented by Mark Rothenberg at the American College of Gastroenterology meeting in 2023, just recently. And he looked at some a sub-analysis of the pivotal phase three Liberty trial. And this analysis, we're looking at whether or not being on a PPI made a difference or not. And we'll be looking at not only histology, some symptoms, and endoscopic results. In this first panel, we're looking at Part A and Part B, which were patients were randomized either to placebo or to pilumab, weekly doses. And again, we're again looking at eosinophil counts or, or histology. And we're looking at here the response of looking number of patients who had eosinophil counts less than six, which was one of the primary endpoints in the study. As you can see, whether you were on a PPR or not, it made absolutely no difference. The patients who were on placebo had anywhere from about 4 to 8% response rate, while the patients on the PPI or not on a PPI, both worked, had a response while on the pillow map anywhere from the mid 40s all the way up to 70%. So this shows that being on a PPI, you're, still, you're going to respond to the pillow map whether or not you had been on a PPI in the past or not. The second thing we're going to look now, this is looking at symptoms, which was the other primary endpoint, which we looked at something called the DSQ or the dysphagia symptom questionnaire. And here again, the patients on active therapy, which is the purple bars and the placebo, which is the orange bars, patients on the active bars did better than the patients on placebo. It's not significantly significant for everything. And some of that's probably due just because we're looking at very small ends. So you get you don't have a tight error bars, but it really shows that patients got better. Again, for symptoms, the other primary endpoint 
whether you are on a PPI or not. So showing that the drug works with in PPI naive or PPI patients who have been on PPIs in the past. Luke, um, any other additional thoughts you think about with this abstract, with the use of PPIs or not, as you present the next abstract? Not really, dear Jonathan. I think you hit the nail precisely on that very abstract. And I just might add that as a clinician, I think it's reassuring to see that you get the efficacy or that you can see the efficacy of that drug regardless of PPI use. And I would draw the conclusion that if I don't have a clear indication for a PPI, for instance, reflux disease, I would try to stop it under a successful maintenance therapy with uh, dupilumab. Yeah, clinically, we're doing the same thing and it seems to be working. So, Okay, so now after you mentioned the uh, symptoms in the Liberty program with or without PPI, this is another very interesting abstract looking at the evolution of symptoms, uh, at the looking at the DSQ, so the validated uh, severity of trouble swallowing with a 14 days uh, recall period. And I think... Uh, Jonathan, you would agree with me, it's extremely crucial nowadays to look at symptoms in EOE if we think about other studies and compounds, be it IL-5 or IL-13, where we have been seeing a dramatic improvement of histology, but there is doubts whether this also translates into um, an improvement of symptoms. And this is now looking again at the Liberty program you just introduced already. So this is a way of looking how do symptoms evolve on the therapy. And you see at the top curve, this is the improvement of symptoms on the left and uh, worsening on the right of the um, y-axis in the middle and for the top this is the virum dopilumab and placebo at the bottom and what is elegantly shown here is that a fair amount of patient virtually all will have some form of improvement of the dsq under the virum therapy and only a very tiny fraction with no improvement or worsening at the same time if you look at the placebo group the, there is a um, and not so clear picture, you have some placebo response of symptoms, but it's less um, pronounced than with the virum, but and you also see a disease worsening. So this study elegantly shows us, this is the phase A of the trial for weekly dosing, that you have a significant benefit also in terms of the symptoms. Now, you already mentioned that there is a phase B of that study where there was also um, dosing every other week. And what we know from the program is you saw an improvement in terms of the primary endpoint histological response and remission, but the effect on symptoms was less pronounced and didn't uh, achieve clinical significance. And with that uh, way of showing the results of symptoms, you can also see that the difference in two placebo is less pronounced here with the dosing every other week. So this is an interesting way of illustrating the benefit in terms of symptoms of the weekly dosing. This is about um, how would the therapy work in treatment naive patients with EOE versus those that already had been exposed to drugs. And I think this is a critical question in clinical practice, because if you look, for instance, at other inflammatory diseases of the GI tract, and IBD may be a good example here, what we have been consistently learning in recent years and decades is whenever there is a patient that had failed standard therapy, the chances of a worse responding to an emerging or a new drug are considerably worse. And the big question now would be, what is with the dupilumab? Is, it the, make, does, is there any difference whether a patient has been previously exposed to PPI and topical steroids, and even more so if the patient had been refractory? And if you just look here um, at the rates of histological remission at the table, so that would be the third line here, the reassuring uh, numbers that you can easily, easily appreciate here is that there does not seem to be a crucial difference 
between patients that never had been exposed or failing previous therapy and patients that had been seeing and receiving PPI and topical steroids. And amongst all the other items here on the tables, let me just highlight the prior TCS, the prior topical corticosteroid use, and specifically the topical, uh, the corticosteroid refractory patients. And I think it's really encouraging for a clinician to see that the response rate was very high with more than 90% even in that population. So the bottom line from that abstract appears to be that there is no uh, significant difference in patients that had been failing topical, uh, topical corticosteroids and or PPI prior to receiving dupilumab. And this is uh, certainly important and encouraging to see. Okay, so I'm happy to present now an, another um, part or another twist of the Liberty program. We have been hearing quite a lot already on that program from you and also from myself. Now, another important question as a clinician is to look at whether body weight BMI might have an impact on the response to therapy. Why could that be? I mean, it's evident that if you have a very high BMI, the dose that you require for, for a biologic, for a given agent, could be different according to BMI. We have been seeing that and learning that for the last 20 years or so with infliximab. And the question now would be whether there is a signal that patients with a higher BMI in EOE would show differences in response and potentially less robust clinical and histological efficacy. And the simple answer to that question is a no. If you look at the results of that study, according to BMI, there is no indication that patients with a higher BMI have a less consistent response to the key endpoints presented here on the table. And I think this is reassuring to see that data and to know that as a, from, a, from the perspective of a clinician, if you deal with a patient with a, that is obese or has a high BMI in the overweight section, there is no indication from that data so far that a higher dose would be required on top of that. And uh, with that conclusion, I would like to hand over once more back to you, Jonathan, for a next abstract. So now we're looking at a, uh, an abstract again presented at the, at the European meeting, and again looking at liberty. And this is looking at improvement, again, placebo versus dupilumab, looking at whether or not the improvement in endoscopic findings now. So this is EREFs and histology, whether or not you were on active or perceived, it, whether you were on prior steroid use or not. So looking at the panel, we first look at in the endoscopy, whether you were on swallowed steroids in the past, as you can see, there really is no difference between the two, whether you're on steroids in the past, your endoscopy findings was changed by just looking at the visual endoscopy. And the bottom is now looking at histology, where we talked, I talked about before, both the grade analysis and the stage analysis, looking at prior use of topical steroids, patients respond throughout. It really seems to make no difference along those lines looking at that. So patients really, prior use of medication, we know we looked at PPIs, now we're looking at steroids. Patients really respond to both either at week 24, week 52, in these patients really telling us that um, patients get better despite, regardless of prior therapy. And I'll pass it back now to Luke, who will now talk about our next, our next abstract. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan, for showing again this data on the topical steroids. This is reinforcing a bit to what we already have seen from the American abstract in the naive and not naive patients. Well, the, this next abstract, um, as you hand it over to me now, is about sendakimab. So sendakimab um, may be um, a bit comparable to dupilumab in the mechanism of action. It's another biologic. It's also a monoclonal antibody targeting 
IL-13, but um, it's only targeting IL-13 in contrast to Dupilumab with a dual uh, cytokine um, profile. And so this antibody is also uh, at the current um, stage of development. We have not been seeing the phase um, three data yet, but we have been seeing the phase um, uh, two data. And so this data presented um, looked at whether there is changes in the um, gene expression profile in EOE patients that were exposed to that drug. And um, well, this is what, what you would expect. What the study found is that some of the key um, downstream signals um, of IL-13 signaling were shown to be affected. And this is, so to speak, um, a study to really look at the epithelium at the, and at the epithelial cells and to investigate whether the pharmacodynamic effect of the drug is in place. And uh, there were indeed interesting observations in terms of that pathway. And I think this is important work also with the question that Jonathan also addressed before when he showed the data of the HSS specifically looking at fibrosis. So the big question now with these agents, including Sendakimab, but also Dupidumab, is as to whether these agents also have an effect on fibrosis that either is already there in the sense of potentially reverting an established fibrosis or to halt the progression of fibrosis. And this is why I think such work on the downstream effect in the epithelium is of crucial importance. And uh, I'm excited to hear or to, to observe what we will be learning in the near future with regards to our emerging treatment options such as Sendakimab. All right, Jonathan. So I hand once more over back to you for presenting the last abstract. So the last abstract we'll be presenting is from the recent um, American College of Allergy and Asthma meeting. Um, and this is an abstract that I'm happy to present because it is my abstract. Um, and this is work done by one of our fellows. And we designed a clinical trial to look at what we thought was a key question because in these trials, patients who were on diet couldn't add back foods. Could we add back foods? And what we did in this trial was we had patients who knew had a food trigger. So there was we did milk, egg, soy, and wheat, the four most common triggers of food. And they had to have a trigger by the standards things. They had to have symptoms and you add the food back because changes in biopsies. And they had to have it done. In this trial, they were patients were put on dupilumab. And then if the biopsies were normal, they added the foods back. If the biopsies were not were normal to less than six, they added the food back. If they were six to 15, they sort of stayed where they are. If they were greater than 15 on that initial biopsy, they were thrown out. Um, as they moved along with the food, so if you were less than six, you get to add more, more foods. If you were less, six to 15, you stayed the same. And you were greater than 15, you sort of, cut things back in half. As you can see, these were our initial 20 patients. Like most things in EOE, it is a predominantly male disease. Um, and the trick of foods were the common foods, milk, egg, soy, and wheat. And as you can see in the study guideline, we can see we did, we did biopsies every three months. So you would do treatment at three months or earlier than we did in the clinical trials. And then we did six, we did a food, added back in, as you can see, Six, less than six, we went on. Let six to 15, we stayed the same. Greater than 15, we reduced. And we start, we'd start with one serving size and each thing we went up, up to two serving size or ad lib, or you can add a whole new food depending on what you wanted. And this slide is the key endpoints. Basically at the first endpoint, basically we had a 94% response rate. Basically everyone responded, similar to what we saw with the naive patients, so much better than the clinical trials. As we moved along, as you can see, most patients, so at the first time point, 60% of the patients were able to add the food in. Um, two patients or 15% sort of had to stay where they were, and three patients had to go back a step. 
But interestingly, at the next step, so now at longer therapy, everyone's advancing. The patients that failed before now are able to advance. And even at the ad lib dosing, basically everyone's advancing. So at the end, we had most of our patients were really advancing. And it just tells me that sometimes that longer therapy is better, that you can st- that some patients don't need three months or six months, but may need nine months of therapy to add back the food. And it's probably better to add back the food slowly, not ad lib at once, but add it back one serving size and two serving size and add things along. So that was what we found very exciting for these patients because that was one of the big things that many of our patients wanted to do. What they, can I eat more food now? And the answer is yes, but don't do it slowly. Don't do it all at the same time. So there's two other molecules that are in clinical trials. One is the anti-TSLP called tezopilumab, and that drug is actually approved in the United States for asthma. It is now in a phase three trial in adolescents and adults for EOE. The other, the second drug that's in clinical trials, an anti-KIT drug, it's in a phase two trial, and it's called bazovolumab. CDX0159, and that both these drugs, we have no clinical data this time, but we are are anxious to see how well these new molecules work. Does any of this data in in the true yardsticks, which we'll go over in a minute, from the guidelines, has it changed how you thought about things and where you're starting them at the current time? Have this changed your practice from all these new emerging abstracts? Yes, it, it changed them um, uh, quite frankly. So in my um, clinical practice, so you mentioned the patients that you at the very beginning that would potentially qualify for an advanced therapy in general and the biologic uh, in specific. And so you mentioned the groups of atopic comorbidities and also um, those that failed uh, topical steroids or had side effects. And in my clinical practice, the the full-blown failures, they are there, but they are not that common. But patients that are reluctant to continuously being exposed to topical steroids are quite common. And some of them perceive that there are uh, side effects. So uh, knowing that you have an advanced therapy option available that uh, potentially controls these patients on the long term uh, is reassuring and some patients really would favor that. And um, what you mentioned in terms of these atopic comorbidity, I personally feel that now that we know that um, an agent as dupidumab is also effective in in asthma, atopic dermatitis, or even uh, the chronic rhinosinusitis with or without polyps, we as uh, gastroenterologists are more um, more detailed in looking at these comorbidities, which previously we may not have been uh, paying the attention that they require. So in other words, I think an agent that has a, a more broad um, efficacy profile may be even helpful also to um, foster the communication between the different um, uh, specialties in medical uh, practice. And I think this really somehow has changed uh, the way we, we do medicine. And and maybe uh, be, before we move on with the, the discussion on dupidumab, so the, the abstract data that you just uh, presented with the reintroduction of diet, I was wondering, uh, Jonathan, um, some of the patients that had been under prolonged dietary treatment and you offered them the uh, option of being exposed to the drug and then um, successful food reintroduction if they responded to the drug. Um, it may not have been too difficult to recruit the patients, I guess. Right? No, this, this, wasn't, this actually was an easy study to recruit from. Yeah. It, the idea from the study actually came from our patients. It was one of these, we were asking our patients, what do you want to learn? It's like, it was like, can we add food back? This is really what we, it was one of these like, okay, let's find out. Let's actually, let's do it in a really rigorous way to find out. And doing it slowly, doing it sort of, if I worried if I did it ad lib, and I think if we did it that way, people would have failed. But doing it this way, it really made a difference. Going slowly made a difference. And it was definitely a patient-driven thing. And I agree. Um, 
the all this other abstract that it depends whether you're steroid responsive or not steroid seen steroids before or PPIs before or not, that it really works and everyone is really encouraging because that's really I think what we see, we often see the secondary and tertiary referrals for these patients. So it was very exciting. And as an allergist, I've been using the Pilimab for about seven, eight years now for atopic derm. And it's really exciting to see that, hey, I have one drug that can treat many of my patients. So it's a really exciting thing to see. This is a slide. This is one of many, a couple different algorithms out there for treatment. And, and I think it really is a really useful algorithm for when we think about treatment. This is from both the sort of bit and pieces from both the European and the American allergy societies um, and GI societies. Um, I mean, a lot of it's the same. I mean, the diagnosis is no different, right? We still got to make sure they have the disease. We're not missing anything else. And then it really comes to a shared decision-making, which I think it's really important to involve our patients with is what's the right thing. Typically, we typically do PPIs first because PPIs, hey, if you, my mind is if you're getting better with an over-the-counter medicine in the United States, you're pretty good. You have mild disease. And after that, it really depends on the patient what they want to do, whether they some patients want to take the allergen out, some patients want to do a shot, and some patients shot scare them and they want to use steroids. And I really think it's you have to really go over that and do what we call shared decision making. I mean, that's the way I've developed my way I treat patients. And I really like this sort of um, algorithm that's been laid out. Luke, yeah, what, do you guys, what do you guys do? I can only fully agree with you, Jonathan. I think this um, shared decision making, it may be sometimes used as a bit of a buzzword, but I think both of us agree that it's really crucial and important. So we always tend to um, provide the patients all the options that are out there, including diet, um, PPI, topical steroids, and now also do Pilumab. And I think it's important to present those options to the patients and to also discuss the pros and the cons. And this shared decision-making um, also makes it much easier than to follow the therapy. I think it increases the adherence and the motivation of the patient to follow the therapy, and it potentially may even increase the response, right? If you as a patient believe that you were actively involved in the decision, um, this is um, most likely also promising signal for the ultimate response. And um, what you now mentioned also with, uh, with your given study that you presented at the very end, I think to have more options available, this uh, provides us with the flexibility we need. For instance, um, we have a lot of patients that um, at a certain point in their life say, I want to do the elimination diet, I'm fed up with the topical steroids, but I could also imagine that such a patient comes at, uh, to a point in his or her life, maybe an exchange year whatsoever, travel to a country where they say, I want to have the liberty to eat whatever I want. And then they may be more motivated to start the drug therapy so that they have this liberty. And who knows, at a certain time, they may switch, big, uh, they may, uh, switch back to diet. So I really think uh, work as yours is important to to uh, show the mobility between the different therapies. And, uh, and I also fully agree with you that the decision-making together is, is absolutely key. Yeah, I, thank you. I, mean, I, I see this a lot in my young adults. When they go off on their own, they want, to, they want to do one thing and then they change their mind, they go back to do something else. And I, so that, that group is really a great group for that. And I, I do think it's important that we discuss all the options with with our with our patients. I am. Yes, even more so, Jonathan, if I may, it's important because if we look at the guidelines today, at least the guidelines in, in my GI world, like you as allergists uh, you, and immunologists, you are much more advanced in terms of positioning these agents. But we as gastroenterologists, if you look at the major EOE guidelines uh, that are available, so the European one is uh, 217, Dupilumab isn't even mentioned evidently because it was not present at the time, but also the German and the British guidelines 
very recently published 22 and 23, they only mentioned it, dupilumab may be considered. And so it means that we as clinicians have to um, find the correct uh, place of topidumab and position the drug, when to use it, when not to use it, what to use first, or use topidumab even first line. And um, one way of doing that in the lack of, of a clear guideline and evidence on the positioning is certainly to discuss it with the patient. And as always in medicine, we have to uh, get our experience as clinicians and to know the drug better, right? Yeah, which brings up the which our next slide, which is when we would actually consider when, when to do first line. This is the exact point. And I yeah. think there's some ones that are pretty easy to think about it. As, I mean, as first line is the one we were talking about for the person who has, hey, I'm going to give you one drug. And this is when we first use it. We were using initially for patients who had asthma and they had EOE at the same time, but we needed it more for their asthma. But is that um, shared decision making that's went al along the line. And then it's the step up or potentially even as first line for some of these patients, the patients who have really severe disease. And I think we don't know with the patients who have that strictures or the failure to thrive, whether they use that as a first line. But clearly, if you're failing failing things, that's where you are, whether you're failing because you don't want to do it or that you failed before or you're having adverse events. These are all really important reasons to think about when we think about it from first line versus step up. And some of this can go back and forth. There's a definite crossing over whether some are first line, whether are second line. I really think as we move along, especially for some of our severe patients, whether or not to step things up, because I think now in the GI world for the IBD, these often jump to biologics first for some of your severe patients. And I think it, we may end up doing the same thing in EOE, but still to be determined. This is definitely a, a key question that you raised, Jonathan. And uh, if you think back uh, in bi uh, to biologics in IBD at the very beginning, when they uh, came up more than 20 years, 25 years now from, from here, when did we start to use them in the very severe last resort patients, right? We had a, we were uh, severely reluctant to start them. And then we realized they do work in the severe cases, but we also realized they may be working even better if you start them more earlier in the course of disease. And now the same may happen if a, a drug like topinumab emerges in the field of IBD, the difference here may be the standard therapy is not that established um, as it has been in IBD. And um, I really also think the more we start to use the agent, um, it may be perfectly realistic to think that we will be using it more early. And uh, um, I fully agree with you, specifically severe patients. So if you have a patient with already a stricture and a severe inflammation at baseline and where you feel as a clinician this smells like trouble to come maybe um, another food impaction whatsoever um, this may be a perfect candidate for dupilumab right away and also if you look at the label um, the way at least it will be in my country or it is in my country you are not forced to have a, um, a failing therapy up front to start such a treatment and i think with the increase in experience, Jonathan, we will have to learn the, the better positioning. And um, well, this is what it makes it so exciting. And we as experts and our colleagues, we have to work on guidelines and, uh, and provide guidance to other colleagues, right? Yes, I think you're totally right. I, just, I agree with you 100%. It's going to be really interesting to see how things change over the next several years as we learn more and more. I mean, we know from we've been using it for other things for a while. So we know sort of some of the safety profile, which has been really reassuring. And we'll see what these additional other biologics that will be coming out besides the Pilomab, where, the, where they fit in the pathway, where they were, they're equivalent, superior, inferior, don't know until we get more data, but it'll be really interesting to see in the next several years, as I think the therapies are really gonna change pretty dramatically. Absolutely. So it's going to be exciting times in the next 
is not only in EUE, but in, in immune-mediated TH2 diseases in general. First, I want to thank Peer View and Regeneron and Snowfee for sponsoring this event. Please complete and submit your post-test evaluation for credit. Don't forget to download the slides and practice aids. Um, watch the replay of this event in, in for the next 24 hours and further online activities in the upcoming week. And again, don't forget to visit us at the URL listed above. Thank you so much again, Jonathan. It was really a pleasure. I also like to thank uh, Peerview for having us and uh, thank you so much.